Welcome to the second lesson in Frog Fractions. Once again, if you are yet to complete the practical element of this coursework, we recommend you stop this video immediately and proceed to Frog Fractions 2. If you have trouble finding your coursework for Frog Fractions 2, we recommend searching Steam for glitter. Hi, my name's Hunter. And I'm Amy. Together, we run the Ashby Brewery and Indie, Indie Game Studio. Two years ago, we changed the face of edutainment with the critically acclaimed Frog Fractions. But despite our success, fractions remain one of the least understood representations of numerical value amongst children aged 8 to 12. We've got a plan to fix this, but it won't work without your help. Your help. Your help. Your help. So the, 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 the question, the burning question that I had for that year was how can I make, how can I realistically make a sequel to Frog Fractions and have it still be a significant surprise? And the answer, which I eventually came to, is don't call it Frog Fractions and don't put your name on it. <laughs> which is ridiculous. And so I just leaned into that. Make a really audacious Kickstarter pitch. Uh, I was still, I mean, really stressed the whole time. Like, I don't know how you can run a Kickstarter and not be super stressed, right? And so yeah, that was how I, you know, paid my rent for the next three years, because I was living really frugally. But in terms of like what the project was going to be, even at the time, I had no idea. There was the, there's this executable that I made that is the game. But then, the, all, like, the real Frog Fractions, I think, is actually, it's more like the arg and the thought in your head of wondering what the game could be. The first Frog Fractions relished in subverting player expectation. So if Jim was going to do it again, he had to subvert the expectation that he was going to make a game about subverting expectations. The story of Frog Fractions 2 is an odyssey of the absurd. It starts with an audacious Kickstarter, one where Jim promised to make Frog Fractions 2, but also promised that once it was released, he wouldn't tell anyone where it was. It involved an alternate reality game, or ARG, that ran alongside development, pointing clues to where Frog Fractions 2 may appear. It involved a second, separate ARG that hid symbols in over two dozen other video games. It involved creating a multitude of genre-bending experiences and finding a commercial game willing to be the shell that Frog Fractions 2 lived inside. Confused yet? Don't worry. The story of how the Frog Fractions 2 game was designed is almost as bizarre as how Jim designed the experience around it. It was about a year later when I was like, okay, I'm running out of money, I need to like figure out what I'm gonna do for the next couple of years. Uh, the first Frog Fractions was outsider art, because I was not part of the indie dev scene at the time. Right. How can I still make art that feels like outsider art, that still feels really weird? Um, and I ended up maybe overcompensating by just making all my game illusions really obscure. And making a lot of them. Yeah, the game is, I would, like if the first Frog Fractions takes you like 45 minutes, this game will probably take you like eight hours. <laughs> I told you that I had made Frog Fractions 1 in basically in chronological order. What that gave me was story coherency. And I'm not really someone who thinks in terms of a narrative, but I got it for free, like because just because of the way I made the game. A story, if nonsensical, about two characters that are like together adventuring through this through this weird world. Like a buddy movie. Yeah, like a buddy comedy. And Frog Fractions 2, for like a year, I was making individual game prototypes, little mini games. And some of them were fun, and most of them were funny, and none of them were related to each other in any way. And are those the games we see in Frog y Fractions? Yes, yeah. the first one that was good was Spaxris. And that was like my first sign of like, this is, this is probably gonna be good. 
I'm really happy with this. But it was not in any way connected to the other thing that I thought was really good, which was text world. And so at this point I was realizing like, none of this stuff is connected. How can I actually make this into an experience? Spaxtris, a game where you attempt to annoy your xenomorph housemate enough to force them to move out, struck an irreverent tone Jim was satisfied with, while his love of Tim Sweeney's ZZT provided inspiration for the overworld. Tex World would be the pace that held this new game together, a brave decision, considering how intimidating many players find and see dungeon crawlers. When I started doing prototypes of like, what can I, what can I do with this game, that was the one that I liked best and that was the one that resonated best with playtesters. And so I, I really kind of doubled down on it and like, let's, let's make this be like the, the meat of the game. And I think that was the right decision from where I was, but I, I definitely knew even at the time that it was gonna turn a lot of people off. Jim spent a lot of time prototyping new games, going to game jams and creating new versions of old ideas. So he decided that while Tex World would provide the skeleton of the game, he would plug a vibrant mishmash of subversive games into it. Games that came from all manner of inspirations. In terms of um, funny, I think I like Spaxorus best. There's, there's a sequel to Spaxorus in the game that most people haven't gotten to that I think is like, really ramps it up. And in terms of fun, I actually think the best thing in there is a game that I didn't design. So I had a pledge tier in the Kickstarter, which was, I will do a game jam with you. And only one person pledged at that level, and it was somebody I already knew, uh, who I probably would have done a game jam with at some point anyway. And he had been working on this game, kind of an active time battle system chess, mashed up with Space Invaders. When, when it came time to like, to deliver on that uh, jam promise, I was like, how about we just adapt this game to be a part of Frog Fractions 2? I, I thought that was a really promising, like, yeah, I, I really like this game, actually. Like, he wants to make that into a full standalone product, and I think that's a really good idea, and he still, like, we set it up so that he still owns the rights to that, so he can do whatever he wants. Um, I think it's a really powerful idea that could really go places, and it was really fun to, and useful to co-opt it for playing a minigame for five minutes as a, as a break from my game. In Biker Chicks, those, are those backers? Yeah, all the characters are backers who pledged at the uh, be a character level. Okay. Yeah, they sent in, they all sent in their own photos. At the time, I didn't know what, they, what that game was gonna be. Like, I, so what I asked them for was a photo and their blood type. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's, it's a, like a very Japanese thing. Um, which I just thought was like, what a funny thing to be fixated on. Uh, and so when it came time to like, okay, like I, how can I, how can I put a, how 80 or however many people in the game as characters, it ended up being a lot more ambitious than uh, uh, it had to be. Like coming up with 80 unique special powers in a turn-based light, turn light cycles game, like I feel like I'm pretty proud of that. Where did the idea of importing a Mass Effect 2 save come from? Uh, that was just the joke. That was like, it would be funny if you could import your Mass Effect 2 save. That then became like two weeks of work making it happen. It knows your name, so it calls you by name. Okay. It changes your, because this all comes up in the context of like your character creator, which is really just choosing a face color. Okay. It changes your face color to be the approximate color of your face in the game <laughs> in Mass Effect 2. So this is like pulling a color out of the palette that's not in the EGA palette. And there's also a puzzle later where you, you meet somebody and you talk to them and they give you like a paragraph of text for every one of your uh, crew members in Mass Effect 2. Oh my god! And the text, uh, you have to read the text to figure out like, okay, I need, uh, I need a save where Jacob's dead and Ashley's alive <laughs> and Garrus is dead. And so you need to like either in some way come up with a save file where the exact right combination of crew members are alive or dead to solve this puzzle. <laughs> You're such an asshole. Thank you. <laughs> Barber Pole Position is a game where uh, there, there are up to four players and every player has to match up two lines to make their car go faster. And the way you match up, make your, you move your line around is you sing at a higher or lower pitch. So you're holding a microphone, you're sing, singing like, uh, uh, 
Okay, we're right here. Lead. Eee. Uh. And it's up to four players, so there could be four people doing that in the same room. And that's the joke, is the sound of four people doing that at the same time. And I've never seen a video of this. Nobody, oh, really? I, don't think, I don't think any players in the wild have actually done it. Please, <laughs> facing the camera again, make that video and then send me a link on Twitter. I, I think the, the idea of mashing up Flappy Bird and the cook, a clicker um, came before the idea of what the actual gameplay was going to be. Uh, and it was actually a friend of mine who pointed out that like, well, what obviously what, what the gameplay should be is you're trying to keep the bird between two pipes as you sell and buy these, uh, these stocks and on the stock market. I was working with James Hoffman. We had just done another game jam, and I forget what game we had finished at that time, but at the same time, there was a game jam called Fuck This Jam. Um, where the idea was you take a genre you hate and make a game in it. And we were like, okay, let's make a, like a free to play, like a microtransaction game. And we brainstormed a bunch of ideas and one of them was like, okay, you are a Silicon Valley programmer uh, and you need to shave every morning. And like different, like different events happen to you every morning. Like, oh, the lights are out, you need power's out, you need to shave in the dark. Oh, you're late for the bus, you need to shave extra quickly. Oh, you're out of shaving cream, you have to be extra careful. It would be a game where like you would play every day because you shave every day. Right. So like you, you come back to it each day and you, you are placed in this new scenario. We had just done another game jam so we were exhausted and got nothing done. But what we did do is we registered a website called A Beard Forever Voyaging. I don't remember where the idea of shaving the president came in specifically, but I, I actually finished a shaving engine implemented in 2D. So it was like implemented, implemented in Flash to have a shave, like a, a pretty like, I think a pretty decent shaving simulation yeah. engine. Like as you finished the shave, you would go on Twitter in the game and see other like public figures, like, uh, like world leaders and cabinet members commenting on your beard. The shaving game in Frog Fractions 2 came from that idea. We're like, okay, how can I like make a sequel to this shaving game where it's in full 3D? I replaced the Twitter engine stuff with like JRPG cutscenes. <laughs> which Obviously. is pretty fun, pretty fun to write. Jim outdid himself, creating hours upon hours of ridiculous games, but he still didn't have a key element, the shell game, the game that Frog Fractions 2 would live inside, buried deep within, hidden, waiting to be discovered. It could have been any game, but perhaps it was fitting that the game Frog Fractions 2 would eventually call home was on paper as ridiculous as the game it was hiding. So that was made by Craig Timpany, who lives in New Zealand. We've been friends for a long time. Coming out of the Kickstarter, I was pretty sure I wanted to get more funding. Uh, I needed to pay my artist, and I needed a place to put the game. I started like a bunch of avenues of research, like uh, is there a publisher we can use? Mm. Uh, is there an existing game I want to shove this game into? I didn't know what I was going to do. Like Craig had wanted to make this game about fairies building tree houses in, you know, in the forest. And we ended up pitching together like uh, this pair of games to Adult Swim who, who already wanted to work with me. And that's how I ended up getting my friend the money to make this game that he wanted to make. So we ended up making these two pairs of games working together. It, it's fascinating that like you could have put, put Frog Fractions 2 into anything, like the straightest game ever. But yes. even on its on its own terms, Glimmering Grove is, is fucking mental. Like what a weird idea. But was it was he was he was that just like a genuinely a game he wanted to make? Like yeah, that was straight, that was a game that was a game he wanted to make. Um, and and I think Glittermitten Grove is a lot more savvy in terms of marketing decisions. Like, I th there's a real audience for that kind of game out there. Like, there are, there's a demographic that loves fairies. Right. And there aren't that many games for them. Not good ones, you know? Have, have you heard of anyone who got the game, like, expecting this to be some fairy city building? There, there have definitely been some Steam reviews that felt very insulted. Oh, like no. that, like thought we were making fun of them. Oh no! Yeah, that oh. was a that was a real shame. Like no, like we fucking want that to be a good game. Like if you pay money for your fairy city building game, we worked hard to make that a good game yeah. for you. 
for the people who want that game. I have talked, I've, I've talked about how I wish I charged money for Frog Fractions, but it would have been fraud to do so because if you buy this game to, to teach your children fractions, you're not gonna get, like, it doesn't do that. Like, not even close. Um, and, and that was one of the reasons we wanted, no, no, like, if we're gonna sell this game, it has to be the game we're selling. Yeah, you're, you're bumping up against some really strange, like, legal, you know, parlance that has been fine up till now because nobody's decided to do, like, the positive bait and switch that you're <laughs> attempting to, <laughs> to pull off here. Right, yeah. yeah. While Frog Fractions 2 was being developed, Jim wanted something for fans and Kickstarter backers to do while they waited. Jim was a fan of alternate reality games, ARGs or ARGs. These are games that use real-world places, internet networks and transmedia storytelling to spin complex mysteries that internet communities attempt to solve. Basically an incredibly complicated ever-evolving treasure hunt where the board is the entire planet and every piece of media you can imagine. The prize at the end of this ARG? The location of Frog Fractions 2. It became very concrete to me when, when someone had said on Twitter that it was amazing that the Frog Fractions 2 team did this like globe-trotting ARG, really elaborate ARG, on a budget of seventy thousand dollars? I replied to this saying like, well, if we had paid everybody involved what their time was worth, it pro the budget probably would actually have been close to a million. That was what made me realize like I'm actually taking all the social capital I earned making Frog Fractions and making the the Kickstarter v pitch video that that really like fired up people's imaginations. Right. You know, I'm spending that that money that exists entirely in like. In, in people like wanting to be part of this project because it's cool. So I started building the ARG before I knew I was gonna work on Frog Fractions 2. I had built it for people who went to GDC in 2013 because was that was gonna be my first GDC. I wanted to give a good impression to people. And so I built this like mini ARG and put a clue on my business card okay. and I gave my business card to people and I was like, maybe they'll see the clue and follow all this trail and go on the websites and call these phone numbers. And, and nobody noticed because you're super busy at GDC, you don't have time for that shit. <laughs> and so that stuff was all there. And I just attached it to Frog Fractions too, just like, cause it's there. Like, yeah, well, why not have this, like I have a clue pointing to this ARG at the end of the pitch video. Jim, hard at work on the game, was struggling to put time into this. So he enlisted the help of Justin Bortnick to run the ARG for him. For two years, Justin ran an outrageous ARG with clues and mysteries that included, but were not limited to, cryptic recipes for baking bread hidden on the Twinbeard website, a Mario Maker level containing a hidden message, a special code if you shaved Obama completely in the original Flash version of their shaving game, floppy disks wrapped in tinfoil containing images of bug pornography, and a hacked Luigi amiibo containing a link to a paste bin which references this photo of a woman painted in gold. And if all this wasn't absurd enough, it wasn't even the only ARG. And while that was happening, and part of the reason I didn't have any time for this, was I was actually running a second ARG at the same time that nobody knew was me, right. which was the Sigil ARG, uh, where I would approach indie game developers, and this ended up going in like 30 games or so, I would approach indie devs and say, would you like to like put a tiny part of Frog Fractions 2 in your game? And if they said yes, I would say, okay, here's the sigil. You put this in your game, you put a puzzle in your game that's associated with the sigil. Um, if people solve the puzzle, and it should be really hard because the community is gonna be working on this, it's not just one person. You get, they get a map piece and then once you like find all 30 games, you, all 30 map pieces, you put the pieces together to form a map. Putting all these different map pieces in all these different games with the intent that eventually we would connect these two args. Eventually this would lead to some sort of interesting payoff and I hadn't figured out what. So we were like, we were like four or five months from release I think. Justin had given me a wooden box that he had filled with trinkets and said, okay, give this to uh, an arg player because you're gonna be in the same city. And so I had lunch with her and I gave her the box. She confided in me that what she really wanted to do was run a side ARG, modify the contents of the box to lead people to this other ARG that was, that was hers. And so all attention for, from the ARG players went to Erica's right. ARG. And was that like a, like a dead end? Well, her intention was to have her own side story and that would have an ending. Uh, but before that could happen, I realized we need to like actually figure out how to close this thing out because we're coming up on ship. 
uh, in, a, in a satisfying way. Um, and so I started working with her to figure out how to pay this whole thing off. At the same time, uh, I was talking to the Firewatch people, Campo Santo, about putting a puzzle in their game. And when they finally had time to do it, I was pretty close to ship, so I was like, okay, what if we actually use this opportunity to connect the two ARGs? The Firewatch sigil was found in a journal in one of the camps. Upon opening the journal, it has a note with italicized letters that spell out Firewatch Gamecom Data Client JPEG. If you format that correctly into a browser, it displays the following image. Overlay the map, and voila. Is that when people figured out that they were connected? Yes. Or did, yeah. yeah, that was the first time it was publicly, publicly known. Um, and what that led to was uh, a collection of videos of me and Ben McGraw eating soup together. <laughs> Reviewing. Reviewing soup, soup. Yeah. yes. Was that just the confirmation that, the, okay, this is... So I had conceived of using the soup video as like a really like overtly dumb and disappointing payoff to this other ARG. <laughs> and that's kind of an audacious move considering that like I didn't know how I was going to pay it off satisfactorily. Like mm. the idea was like I would have a bad payoff and then later subverting that to make it, oh, it's actually a good payoff. When I was working with Erica to figure this out, how do we how do we actually pay this thing off? There's a there's a kind of device you can buy on Amazon called the the dash button. Yes. And the dash button is like this keychain fob that says Doritos on it, and you push this button in. If you're connected to your Wi-Fi, uh, it just it, it automatically orders Doritos to you from Amazon. <laughs> and there's like one of these for like this Tide detergent and cat food. You can just buy one of probably thousands of these different buttons all with different brands on them. <laughs> yeah, the idea was to make one of these that says Frog Fractions 2 on it. Right. And that morphed into this idea of like, there being a, like a button that's locked, you, so you need to get, to get the key from someone else. Mm. Um, and the idea was that we, we talked about like, can we make this button to connect to their Wi-Fi to actually send us the signal? But we ended up just relying on like, when they upload a, a YouTube video of pushing the button. When they push the button, the game goes live. So Glittermitten was already up at that stage. Glittermitten was, yeah, so you don't really have that much control over exactly when a game goes live on Steam, right. but you do have control over when it patches. So we decided like, we're gonna release the game, it'll go up on Steam, and then to, to the best of our ability, like exactly when they push the button, we put the, make the patch live to make Frog Fractions 2 part of Glittermitten Grove. So everything was ready to go. Glitter Mitten Grove was on the Steam store, not selling very well, and Frog Fractions 2 was ready to be patched in. All they needed was for somebody to finish the ARG by pressing that button. There, there was a, a guy on there who like, yeah, I got this button, but it's Christmas, so I'm gonna be spending time with my family. Right. <laughs> and I'm not gonna be making a, a, YouTube, a YouTube video for you guys just yet. Um, and then there were rumors that he was gonna do it that night. He ended up like, like very early on the day after Christmas, uh, like something like 2 a.m. uploading this video. <laughs> um, That's like a nightmare, like marketing wise. Like... Who launches a game on Christmas? It's such a, <laughs> such a bad idea. <laughs> and Glittermitten had been up for like, what? It was like December 13th so, something, something like two weeks, yeah. yeah. So what was, what was the two week window like for everyone where it was just a fairy sim building game? Uh, it, sales were horrible. Okay. Like no, nobody bought the game. <laughs> right. um, and that, that really drove home for me like, you know, as recently as like three or four years ago, if you got your game on Steam, you were set. As an right. indie developer, you would just have enough money to live. Hmm. There wasn't that many games going up. Right, right. and like every game that went up, it, it just was in front of a lot of eyes. Yeah. Nowadays, you get your game on Steam and that means nothing. Hmm. Uh, just because there are, just, there are so many games up there. How long were you on the new release page? Uh, less, like, I think something like 15 minutes. What? It, it was, oh my god! It was really a short amount of time. I, I wonder, like, if you looked at the newly released under the fairies tag, <laughs> right. it probably would have been 17 minutes. Is that um, fairies F A I though, or is it? F -A? Yeah, that's. That's tough. I think you have to get both. <laughs> okay. The game was live. People could go play it, but there was one problem. Jim had promised that he would never tell people where it was. So, true to his word, Frog Fractions 2 lay dormant inside of Glittermitten Grove, waiting, patiently, for someone to find it. If I remember right, it took like another day or so for them to put the pieces together and figure out where the game was. Okay. And they actually ended up doing the detective work. There was a guy in the Discord who was like putting the pieces together and like he used, uh, I think, I think SteamDB to figure out like what games patched in this span of time and looked at those and saw that like 
This game is made by someone who had worked with me in the past. Right. And the update that I had for the word fraction in it. <laughs> <laughs> and they figured that out. And, and um, it's a real fucking weird ride, man. <laughs> So what did it feel like having it out then? Did it feel relief? It or? was, yeah, it was exciting. It was real exciting, especially because I didn't know that it was gonna be well received. Six to eight months before development when I really started ramping up the beta testing, I got a lot of like intensely negative reactions to the text world. And I ended up like smoothing that stuff out a lot, but obviously not for everybody because I still get those. It's always a little bit of a shame. Uh, and I knew this was gonna happen to like people who like played the first game and really wanted to like the second one but didn't because it's just such a different game. Right. And you can't make the same game again. Like that's that would be automatically a disappointment. And maybe I could have like found a middle. Maybe I should have actually been had like a a frog protagonist, you know? <laughs> that might have been the smart move. How do yeah, how do you feel about it? Cuz I'm actually I'm I'm a little bit surprised at how I wouldn't say down you are, but like you definitely seem to have had like your expectations maybe weren't reached or? Uh, it, it's, it's not selling very well. Right. Yeah. And part of that I think is the price point. We set it at $20 in part because like I think that's what the game's worth and in part mm. because I think that's what games should be worth. Mm. Like games have value. I, I, I'm really upset by the race to the bottom. And the other part of it was that we had a launch sale uh, on December 13th and then that sale ended mm. when the game launched. And then when we tried to put it on sale for that launch, right. uh, Steam was like, no, that would violate consumer protection laws in a lot of countries. Oh, you're kidding. Because it's illegal for, in certain countries, for a game to, to within whatever constraints they have put forth, to not be at its actual stated price right. for yeah. much of the time. Like 30 days or 60 so it days. It was something like that. Yeah. yeah, and so wow. we, we couldn't put the game on sale, and I think that really would have helped a lot. But I mean, I, I really like, it sounds like I'm complaining, but my life is so good. <laughs> I have such a good life, like if so artistically fulfilled, like my personal life's doing really good, is not making me money right now, but I'm betting that as soon as we put it on a Steam sale, that it will. And so like, in the meantime, I'm doing programming work for other games and having a good time doing it. Like, that's a lot of fun. I can't, I can't complain. And getting married soon as well? Uh, that's, yeah, that's happening in, ooh, she's gonna kill me. Uh, <laughs> we can Aug edit this part out. In, in August. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. I got married last August. It's good fun. I recommend it. Yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, I guess... God, I hope it's August. <laughs> Glitter Midden Grove hasn't been a commercial success for Jim, but despite that, he seems incredibly proud of the game that he has made. A nostalgic, genre-bending roller coaster that respects the player's intelligence and rewards them with some of the most unique gameplay they're ever likely to find. But aside from the game, Jim created what he talked about all those years ago at GDC. A mystery. A game that fascinated people all around the world. A game that made them wonder. And in that way, Frog Fractions 2, the game, the Kickstarter, the ARG, was an absolute success. Jim is a unique person, humble, quiet, but with big ideas about what games should achieve. He put his money where his mouth is, using all the social capital and Kickstarter money to create a game that despite not being a massive commercial success, meant something. It meant something to those who backed it, those who played it, and those who heard of it. Hopefully, after watching this video, it will have meant something to you too. The story of Frog Fractions may now be over, but before myself and Jim went our separate ways, I had one final question to ask him. The same question that practically every other person who's experienced Frog Fractions too has to ask him. Would you do a, a third Frog Fractions? Would you do a, a game similar to this again? Uh, I probably would, but I wouldn't tell any, I wouldn't announce it at all right. if, I, if I were to do that. Um, uh, one thing I tweeted recently was that I am still conflicted about whether it was a good idea to release Frog Fractions 2 at all. Right. Because I feel like so much of the value of that Kickstarter was in letting people wonder about the game, about what this game was going to be and when it was going to come. And, but then someone pointed out that like there's 
a whole rainbow of Frog Fractions games you could, could, you could not release in the future. Right. So, maybe, maybe one's already out. 